you, sir. Sir, why don't you take another seat? More on the inside, so it doesn't block the live stream. Sorry about that. Yes. I knew you could actually slide the chair. Too. You know I mean? These things aren't going to the ground. Uh, that's actually one of the things. So uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone who has joined us here today. Uh, please forgive. Uh, we, we put this together. Usually when we uh, bring together these meetings, uh, the interagency emerging tech meetings, it's like 30 of us around the table at the Innovation Hub at the National Archives or here at GSA. Uh, and again, these are not. This isn't like a stage production that we put together on a monthly basis. Uh, it is an actual functional meeting uh, where we come together, we share, we raise issues, um, and then, when possible and necessary, we put together coalitions of agencies across government uh, and put together working with businesses to create solutions uh, on this. Which absolutely, there's no shortage of of needs on that. But a lot of times that can be very surprising to people because a lot of this you don't naturally see emerging tech on our websites and things like that because these programs in a lot of ways and the amount of needs are advancing at a much faster rate uh, than a lot of times our organizations and bureaucracies are used to. Uh, so oftentimes what happens when we meet with agencies or we meet policymakers or, or businesses out there, people don't know and they just then assume it's not happening. And it's not that it's not happening and that there isn't rich and robust conversation and programs around this. It's just that sometimes you don't find it from traditional means like the websites or the press releases or things like that. So that's why it's so important to us today to by any any way we can to really open the doors. It's not enough to say that we want public private partnerships. It's not enough to say that we're working in different ways with businesses and startups and entrepreneurs or working together with each other amongst agencies. We have to show that and we have to open these doors and sometimes again it's not going to be the slickest affair it can be having to use lavalier or uh, microphones like they're real micro you know like handhelds and things like that uh, in order to get it done so thank you so much again for joining us here today and again to sort of set that expectation is this is a functional meeting and this is not just about us talking up here um, you're expected to share ideas. Um, we're going to raise questions. Uh, and also, if you have an idea, if you want to start something, offer it. Because monthly, we put on emerging.digital.gov uh, the action items and notes from all of this. And again, it's actually funny. This is actually our office where we work. We had to move tables and chairs around. Right over there is code.gov, uh, which is obviously the home of open source for government. And that's actually kind of the approach we're trying to take to the emerging technology program is open sourcing as much as possible. Uh, so things that you should know about, things that you should be aware about, you do know about. You don't have to hunt for it. You don't have to submit a FOIA request. This is information that you can use and you already have a seat at the table uh, there that we truly want you to take. Uh, and so with that set in expectations, we have an agenda and we're going to go through things quickly. Some of these programs you might have heard of, uh, you might have seen, uh, and actually the next slide, please. Uh, we don't have very much slides today, again, because if we could have a giant round table and everyone have equal seating, we would do that. We just had to put this together and again, hosted in our own office to open the doors to you. But this is really a round table discussion. So. We have a couple, especially because Dylan from Nest, who they're producing the new blockchain report that's coming out. We asked him to deep dive a little bit further because that's something uh, that we're all really interested in, of course, uh, and looking forward to that report. But other than that, we're going to have just placement slides around topics. We're going to talk and share like what the problem we saw was. What are the solutions that we're trying to come up with that are open to all of you, no matter who you are, whether a federal agency, a business, um, academic um, outreach, um, whether you're civil society, anybody has a role and a seat at this table. So many times in emerging tech, it's easy to feel like it's somebody else's game or it's easy to be intimidated by the terminologies or the processes or the speed at which it goes. Every one of you, no matter who you are, where you came from, or what is your background, is a stakeholder in this program and these technologies. Uh, right now, again, always look to emerging.digital.gov. Every week, we're releasing new things on it. And for instance, you're going to go to the AI section, and there's just placeholder content right now on chatbots and customer service, which is great, but it is a fraction 
of what is going on and what we're doing. Even us trying to be as fast as we can of opening this information up are hindered because we need your help. And we're gonna share some of those opportunities. But again, if you have a question, if you have an idea, now, because we had 400 people sign up for the remote participation on this, uh, is sound is a real thing. That's why it's important we have mics and things like that. So if you do have a question or something, A, and if it's a longer statement, try to go to one of those mics, which I'm told that are taped down uh, to the floor so nobody trips over them. But that also means you gotta go to the mic. Uh, if not, you can come up here, but either way, we just wanna make sure things are mic'd in for the people who are live streaming uh, to be able to check that out. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and just again, a little bit about this program and like how this comes together. Uh, if we've had about a year now, GSA's Emerging Citizen Technology Program. Uh, we work with over 320 unique federal, state, and local agencies, uh, work with international partners, uh, with businesses, uh, really anyone who's a stakeholder. And again, we've already established that everyone is a stakeholder in this future that we're building. Uh, in order to build these programs, partnerships, whatever, because there is no set roadmap forward on this. You're not going to see a plethora of guidance, of policy, of, of basic understanding sometimes of what this is. And it's critical. This is not five years in the future. This is right now. And right now we're building it. And so again, we're connecting as many people from agencies, from businesses as possible, but it's not convening. Convening is just the means of it. It's what we do with it and what we produce. And that is only limited or, you know, the greatest potential is just what you bring to the table and realizing we don't need lurkers right now. We need champions and we need contributors, large and small. Next slide, please. So to actually get things going, uh, and again, we're going to get in a little bit of a tangible here, uh, is Pathways to Acquisition. Where's Kelly Pippin from Federal Acquisition Services? All right, you know what? That's okay. Uh, this is a meeting here. This is a, a confusing. She's actually came out from Fort Worth, Texas. So she probably got lost somewhere in the hallways on her way to get coffee. Uh, but I'd actually like to, and to kick things off, I don't know if people have read the press recently or seen the public dialogue about terms of service agreements. This is an example. Now, one of the things, now we've been at G, I've been at GSA for six years and a large thing we would have to do is negotiate specific terms of service for things like social media platforms to make sure that they are sound and uh, you know what I mean? And up to the standards that we're bound by, by law and standards in the federal government. The amount of complaints I have heard and vilification of this is why it's so hard to work with government and, you know, anybody signs terms of service agreements. Why is the government making such a big deal over what they're using and what the, what the legal terms are? Now you see. And it is something that just because we have to do a little bit more due diligence uh, and something that a long time people complained about the role of government and how it's so hard to do business technology with, with government because they have to negotiate, renegotiate terms of service agreements. You can see this week right now why it is important sometimes that we have more of that diligence and those standards on it. And in fact, if anybody's always interested in checking out our terms of service resources publicly, just go to GSA's website and search for terms of service agreements. We have a lot of resources and information on that. But that's just kind of one example. And by the way, has anyone found Kelly Pippin by this point? All right. There she is. That was perfect timing. <laughs> All right. Would you like to talk a little bit about the project? I would love to talk about the project. So for those of you who don't know about Pathways to Acquisition yet, um, it started basically because acquisition is really confusing. There's many different forms, um, and I tried my best to demystify that for everyone in the emerging tech field. Um, and I thought we were doing really good. We worked within G G GSA, and then we also worked with Jennifer's team. Um, we had some people from DTS help us as well. Um, Actually, I must apologize. Uh, we just went right into it. This is Jennifer Hoover from Homeland Security. Their acronym is VICE, uh, Venture Innovation. Uh, and also she's co-chair um, her organization with our new Venture Capital Advisory Group, which you are going to hear about in a little bit. Uh, she bravely came up here to, to co-chair uh, and we just went right by that. So I can't, they didn't introduce you. That's just. No, I was going to say he didn't do introductions. So, so please, okay. can you just uh, say hello? Oh, hello. 
Jennifer Hoover, Deputy Director for the Office of Venture and Innovation at DHS. And I will be telling you more about the uh, venture, by, uh, venture Capital Advisory Board in just a little bit. All right, thank you so much. All right, now back to it. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so as I was saying, um, we tried to demystify basically the whole acquisition field, anything from challenge.gov to Fastlane, uh, which is Schedule 70, uh, GWAX, you name it. And Does everybody even know what those mean? Or you already get, see I, this guy right here. Uh, I mean, Gary, small business owner. Is it really easy navigating, uh, especially emerging tech acquisitions? <laughs> Derry just said he's not the right person to ask. <laughs> well, see, he knows. How oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he knows because Derry's so supportive of this yes. stuff. Uh, but okay. Yeah. But the point is, we were trying to reach out to those of you who don't know any of those words that I just said. Um, we actually built a neural graph and kind Next of slide. and kind of a chart. Um, this is our neural graph. So to me, this was like very basic way to break down acquisitions. We realized it's it is complicated not. as hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the point was to determine whether or not you actually wanted to get on contract or if you just wanted to do prizes and challenges with the government. Um, so it kind of led you through the different pathways, but very confusing to those of you who do not know anything about acquisition. So we are now going kind of back to the drawing board and we're going to do a journey map, uh, kind of like the one that's on the wall behind you there. Um, so you actually kind of, well, you'll basically get a business. So if you're an emerging tech company working in blockchain, we'll start with that and we'll basically work through the process of this is the first step you would take, this is the second step, et cetera. If you're a cybersecurity company, we would do the same. So hopefully that will be easier to understand than this, but then we will also have this to kind of, after you get your, your feet wet, you'll have this as well. And I do definitely want feedback um, from those of you who have not done business with the government um, because I am coming from an acquisition standpoint. So what is confusing to you, tell me so that I know. Um, and I'm sure Justin will give you my email address. Yes, and this is all actually available if you go to emerging.digital.gov. Again, that's gonna be a way, but again, the, the problem is, so we're trying to create more of a culture of sustained test and evaluation. People like come and they say, okay, we saw that GSA did a pilot program on blockchain for acquisitions, um, that GSA's region in New York, they did um, a great robotic process automation pilot. But then we hear about it on panels and stuff like that. And the question is, well, where do we actually start? I, okay, I'm a program manager. I want to do a pilot or I'm a small business and I want to know exactly how I can provide these services. And that's where it becomes unclear. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. And in the process, we realized, and this is, by the way, not final. This is a draft. We found out just by trying to simplify it and map it out just how, why the 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 you know, the cards can look like they're stacked against people because it's so complicated. So what we're gonna do, and Kelly is leading this effort and we're just so glad for the leadership of Federal Acquisition Services that have been supportive and understanding of this need is really journey map out user, you know, create a whole user experience around it where anyone can see their path forward uh, and to be able to part of, be part of that because we need new businesses at the table. We need new program managers at the table. This is just the beginning of that effort, but it's something please take seriously and please contribute to it uh, because this is just that first step. Yeah, out of curiosity, those of you who aren't feds, who's heard of Schedule 70? Okay, that's good. Fast that's lane, good. startup springboard. Uh oh, okay. hands went okay. down. And it's a fantastic program. Yes. What about challenge.gov? Prizes and competition. This guy knows it all. Yeah. Get him a microphone. <laughs> uh, um, what about uh, joint venture partnerships? Oh, let's see, Derry. Derry knows all. Uh, but again, is all these things are options to you, but what are the conditions? What are, you know, what what are, based on your needs, how right. can you navigate that? This that's what's really going on here. Uh, and so thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing. Does anybody else have more questions yes. on it? Can you use the mic? Oh yeah, because you, you're the actual closest person to the mic. So you, uh, yeah. Yes. You just <laughs> talk like the whole like time. I expect this guy to yell it. No, no, thank you. Is it on? Uh, yes, where does 18F fall into this chart? Well, uh, it's, it's not in this chart per se right now, 
Uh, but that is something that definitely can be added. And you know, actually a little breakdown. People get confused sometimes about even technology programs. We have just over on the other side of the floor, the Presidential Innovation Fellows. Over here, we've got emerging technologies and you've got data.gov and code.gov over there. In between, that whole row is all where 18F sits. So all of us are coming from a different approach on this, but it's all part of a thing where no matter what your issue or problem is, there's someone there that's gonna be able to help you uh, and work with you on that. And that's actually gonna be a whole nother presentation of how things all fit together. Uh, but put it this way, when you hear about presidential innovation fellows and uh, the centers of excellence, everything is kind of based on this fourth floor here where we're having this meeting. And that's something we're trying to work with too, because 18F, they do have their own acquisition workforce. Um, I work directly in FAST, which technically we're all part of FAST now, um, but we're really trying to kind of merge that together and work together. Um, so if you do reach out to 18F, you can get to wherever it is that you actually want to go and not just be stuck with FAST or 70 or 18F. You're never stuck with any of those options. <laughs> You're it's all, stuck with it's, me. It's, it's an invitation. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Did that answer a little bit? Put it this way. The answer is we probably need more information and guidance to yeah. walk people through Definitely, that, which please. is why we're here. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Any other quick questions on this? Yes. One of the things I think you guys uh, may want to consider is uh, partnerships, subcontracting, companies who already yes. have Schedule 70 and helping some companies understand, hey, how can you just partner with a company who already has a contract. It, there's some challenges, yeah. obviously, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a perfect solution, but it is another, a, one yeah. of the easier solutions. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And, and I'll add that while those of us who have supported the federal government space understand how to go to, to the e-library, not many <laughs> folks can actually navigate exactly. and know how to even pull down the schedule um, and find the list that's, of folks who are there. That's something I'll have to add. It's called GSA e-library. Yeah. No, but I actually did start from just obtaining a DUNS number because that's some people don't even know what a DUNS number is. Um, but that's definitely something to add because if you don't know what GSA e-library is, then you really don't know a lot. And we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> yeah. And again, and just to wrap it up on this and thank you so much. And by the way, you can always reach out. And that, that's like why we're here. Yes, please is to let me. you know that these are the things we're working on every day and we want to hear from you and we'll have you be part of it is again, there's problems on being able to navigate things. It's not enough that we can open it up and put it on a website. We have to integrate. There has to be an alignment so people can understand how things fall into pieces. And that's, that's the problem we're trying to solve. This is one way we're trying to approach it. If you have a better way, if you have something else that's needed that's not being addressed, come to us on it uh, because we got to solve the problem. There's another question, sir. Joe Citizen help out with this. That's not affiliated with the company. Are you Joe Citizen, sir? At the moment I am. All right. So Joe Citizen should email kelly.pippin at gsa.gov. And that's P-I-P-P-I-N, not to be confused yeah. with the basketball player. Um, but I did actually start myself um, in health IT. I own a, a small business. Um, so I do kind of try to remember what that's like so that I can help you guys. But um definitely email me things because now I kind of take for granted the knowledge that I have. And just in case uh, 500 people are about to email Kelly, uh, also, if you just go to emerging.digital.gov, so you're going to find that there's listservs that we have. There's some that are focused specifically on government. It's, it's just got to be that way. But we knew we had to open up more. So it spent us a little while getting it approved, but we host public listservs now. And that anybody's able to not only get the information directly, but here's the thing. I hear people say, Justin, we signed up for these listservs. I get emails from you encouraging you to participate. The listservs are two way. Every single one of you can ask a question, share an idea. But what happens is because people get intimidated a little bit by emerging tech or they don't want to sound weird in front of a large group of people like I regretfully had to become accustomed to, <laughs> uh, as they don't know that that's there for them and it's a two-way street. So you're asking how you can get involved. Hey, go to the website, sign up for that information. You're going to receive more opportunities to participate and any, anybody out there will. And But also don't just consume it, share it. I mean, contribute to it because that's ultimately uh, what we're trying to do. Does that answer your question? Awesome. So we look forward to participating in that for everybody. 
All right. So just for sake of time, I think we got a because we, we have a stacked agenda uh, coming. Uh, so the next thing is, so we, we've established a little bit of baseline on this. This time of the meeting, what we do is we're deep diving more into some of the individual technologies. And actually, if Dylan wants to start coming up here from NIST, uh, who they're working on their final report on blockchain itself. Now, a little background on some of what you're about to see, not just with blockchain, but AI and robotic process automation, is... We spent the last year, in a way, organizing people to prove and show and demonstrate the level of interest and business need behind this. What we're starting this month is opening up more, creating more individual, regular program that deep dives into all these individual things. Uh, and part of it, so you don't just have to come here uh, once a month to hear about it, you're already contributing on an individual level. So the first one, we have blockchain, we're gonna have RPA, AI, virtual augmented reality, but our agenda is based on your needs. So if there's something not being covered and you want to start something, you want to see something started, just raise your hand uh, and we can add this to the agenda. But that being said, Dylan, why don't you take it away and introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Dylan Yeager. I'm a computer scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and I'm the program lead for NIST blockchain program. And so I'm going to start today out asking you guys questions instead. So who's heard of Bitcoin? Who's heard of blockchain? I have not. Who can tell me how blockchain works? <laughs> Who's read the NIST 800, uh, 8202 draft publication? Who's commented on it? Oh, I mean, <laughs> you finally beat Derry. <laughs> OK. Um, so that's, that's good and bad. It makes me sad you guys didn't comment. But it's glad a lot of you read it. That's good. So, because we don't need lurkers. We need participants in yeah, comments. Even the hate. it was. It was all right, would be good. So, um, goodness, sorry. Yeah, yeah, disclaimer, standards. This, my opinions, not this. So, I'm going to talk about just a quick overview of the document, some of the work that I'm doing at NIST, some of the standards work that I'm participating in, a few key findings, and then um, some, I guess, time for questions. So, uh, NISTER 8202, that's NIST Interagency Report 8202 on Blockchain Technology Overview, went out for public comment. Public comment is closed. And um, since most of you have read it, I don't have to go over all the content on it, but it talks about some of the mechanics and the building blocks of blockchain technology. And then next slide. Um, consensus mechanism, forking, smart contracts, some categorization ter terminology, um, some misconceptions that we've heard of. Okay. so. Some of the feedback we got was really good. Some of it was really bad. Um, I talked to some people at NIST, uh, asked them, you know, what kind of comments did you guys get on your paper? And they're like, oh, we got 12 comments. I'm like, oh, I got 209 pages of comments. So I'm still addressing them. Um, the, it's going up probably for a second comment period after they're all addressed because of so many additions and so many, hey, can you talk about this as well? Or, hey, I have this misconception. Wait, 209 pages of comments on blockchain. Yes. Um, I, You're going to need AI to help process that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I went through individually, and I replied to everybody who commented, letting them know their, their opinions will be heard and that they will be addressed in the draft. And so uh, that was a long, Cheers. long time. Uh, and it was only a 30-day comment period. Usually, they go out for 45 days, but we decided to do a short one so we can get some quicker feedback and, and start going. So version 2 is underway, and there are more sections. There's uh, going to be more of a focus on permission versus permissionless blockchains because I got a lot of feedback of, hey, this doesn't really apply to permissionless or permission blockchain. You should probably distinguish those two more. So that's something we're doing. Uh, updating some of the terminology because, again, we were a little bit more focused towards permissionless blockchains and permissions. So we're just sort of making it more general. Uh, we're talking about more consensus algorithms and uh, clarifying of some more concepts that were in there. So uh, this is all coming from a research project that I'm doing at NIST to develop an internal blockchain workbench for our researchers in the cryptographic technology group and just pretty much information technology or, or computer security division to develop software and to explore these blockchain technologies in a, a production-like environment that's still internal to NIST. So we're running off-the-shelf commercial blockchain technologies in an internal 
uh, node cluster, and we've purposely made them not work with their real life counterparts so we can't get yelled at for mining cryptocurrency. <laughs> Um, and so these are some of the projects that are uh, being proposed or looked at. So we were looking at identity or the underlying cryptographic mechanisms for testing purposes. And um, we have one person who wants to look at smart contracts and if you can use combinatorial testing so that you can get a wider array of testing on with uh, a, sh a smaller data set. So, and uh, this year, uh, so I'm, I've been doing this through an internal uh, funding mechanism at NIST and we got a second year of funding. So we're looking to increase hardware. I got $60,000 for increased hardware um, and just offer more blockchain technology, essentially. Um, so part of uh, you know the S and this is standards. So we've been working in a lot of standards uh, groups. I'm personally involved with the International Organization for Standardization Technical Committee 307. So that's on blockchains and distributed ledgers. So that's ISO TC 307. I will probably say that from now on. Gary, did you know this organization exists? ISO? Yeah. <laughs> oh, everybody should know about ISO. Everybody here is something in their life that they've touched. So, um, so it's made up of national bodies through uh, 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 each, each country's individual organization that puts them through for that. Uh, it's ANSI through Insights at, uh, in, the, in the US. And it was proposed by Standards Australia. And the next couple of slides are just, these are the, some of the countries that are participating, then some observing members. And then um, it started off with one working group, which means they had a project that they wanted to do, and then several study groups that's like, we want to explore these issues. So the first working group was just on terminology, just to, to harmonize uh, the, the vast vocabulary that blockchain has uh, rolled out to people. And that actually started with a large database submitted and almost every term had about 50 different definitions. And they're trying to unify those so that we can have a common understanding of vocabulary. So that was the first one. So the next slide. So uh, in the second meeting, everything got shook up. Some of these uh, study groups finished, proposed to, to make new working groups. We got two more working groups, one on security, privacy, and identity, and then another one on smart contracts. And so this next meeting, which is in a couple weeks, next slide. So yeah, I think it's May, May something, May 13th. Uh, this is the, the, what the thing looks like now. So we've got three working groups and three study groups, and we're exploring all of these various concepts here. So the next couple slides are just talking about the documents that are coming out of these. Uh, there's test. Uh, technical specifications or technical reports. The specifications have some sort of requirements or, or guidelines. Technical reports are just, hey, this is information for you to use. So the next couple of slides are just all on that. So a couple of the findings that I've had, personal key findings, um, is that people understand blockchain on the entire spectrum. From people who are like, what is this? To, hey, I've got a bunch of pilots I'm rolling out. We're about to do another one. So. If you don't know much about blockchain, which a lot of you do because you raise your hands, don't worry about it. People are still catching up. Um, the next key finding is not everything can be solved with the blockchain, regardless of what people want to tell you. I know. Well, there's only problem. usually there's two things you hear: everything can be solved with the blockchain, and yeah. nothing can be solved with the blockchain. <laughs> right. And it's like, okay, right. some there's got to be something in between. Right. So a lot of people come at us, hey. I want, to, I want to have a blockchain solution. So, well, that's the wrong way to approach this. You should be saying, hey, I have this problem. I think blockchain can solve it. But I've also seen the trend of moving away from we have to use blockchain to, hey, I think we can use blockchain. So the trend has been shifting. And then blockchains are just one part of a solution. It is a data storage consensus distributed type part of a system. You still need a good, robust UI, all these things. So just adding a blockchain to something is not going to make something better. You have to think carefully about it and pros and cons and figure out if it fits your use case. And then, yeah, these are my random personal thoughts. I usually include at least one slide on that. Uh, blockchains, you know, they're new. People are putting them in every sector. I feel that they will eventually find their niche and settle in, and then we won't think about them. They will be just there, useful, doing what they want to do. And um, everybody likes to compare blockchain to to uh, the foundation of the internet, and TCP IP. Nobody cares or thinks about, oh, my phone's routing all its packets through TCP IP. 
and eventually you're not going to care that this software is using blockchain. And that's when I feel to be truly useful and found it. That's awesome. I'm sure there's going to be questions on that. And just a couple of things that I don't know, Jennifer, if anything particularly resonated with you on it, but that people eventually just get over it mm -hmm. a little bit is people either get really worked up in one way or another, and it's clouding what is just responsible management and application and, and test and evaluation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I know for me, when I heard that NIST was approaching this, it's, it's a, again, because the reputation and the role that NIST has and to look at this and have these findings, I think will, will definitely have just a significant impact. Uh, and, and, and so thank you so much for also sharing this before mm -hmm. the report's even done. Again, because yeah. too often we hear about things after the fact in panel discussions, right. uh, not just sharing from the source. So thank so, you. Yeah, like I said, it'll probably go up for a second comment period because of the all the new additions and, and changes to it. So the people who didn't raise their hand for commenting, you'll have a second <laughs> chance. So please let me know, even if it's hate, we enjoyed this. That's good feedback to us. Um, I know when I was writing software for NIST, uh, a lot of the feedback that I got was, hey, there's a bug. Oh, I didn't know that this company in this country was using this software. Nobody told me. So uh, feedback of all kinds, good, bad, is welcome. That's, all, that's awesome. Jennifer. We have some uh, online questions. Online, so. okay. oh, yeah, oh, yeah. By the way, to everyone out there, um, if you are online, we have people solely dedicated to looking at the questions online, uh, including Dan over here, whom we call Danny Cash. I don't think that's. I don't think it's on. Dan, you can come up here and use my mic. Uh, Dan, America, America, Dan. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Uh, wouldn't be a technology meeting without at least, you know, one tech flub here and there. Uh, so a few questions from remote participants, uh, one of which is from Bev Corwin, which is that are these ISO working groups or NIST working groups? They are ISO working groups. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And the second is from uh, Joseph Rios, which is when might workbench be available to other government agencies? So that's something that we have uh, had very early discussions in at NIST. Um, right now, it is very tightly controlled due to the IT infrastructure and all the IT admins. They wanted to keep it as, as small as possible. But we have not ruled out rolling it out to other agencies or even providing the, 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 the initialization setup scripts that uh, I've developed to set it up in your own thing. That's that's absolutely something that we can talk about. So send me an email. I think the next slide has my email on it. So, or, so yeah, there you go. It's standard you government it email. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's just my name at NIST.gov. So it's pretty easy. Get in touch and we can figure stuff out. And by the way, just in case anyone's wondering, we will be sending out um, action item and full notes from this meeting. Uh, so you don't feel like you have to screen grab everything or, or take photos. Uh, we'll be sending out information, contact everything. Again, we're defaulting to open as much as possible to get people this info. Yeah. Uh, is there any, any one more question or anything like that? Because I know that was just a lot that you probably might not have heard about before. This, this gentleman here has one question. Yeah, pass it. So thank you, Dylan. I appreciate your uh, presentation. Uh, my question, well, I know you're focused on the technology side and the working groups, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Has there been any talk about cross-pollination with um, other areas like smart cities or how it could be used in specific industries? I didn't We're quit your list. Cities, we, we yeah, sorry, I am involved. So Quick conversation. Um, yes. Yeah, so. Within ISO, there's a, a working group, or I guess it's a study group, solely dedicated to use cases and verticals and whatnot. So they, they're having, I believe, a document coming out that's just a document list of use cases where this technology could be applicable. Um, there's no working group for smart cities per se in, in ISO yet. And there's, there's not been any official talk at NIST about that that I know of. What about other industries? I, didn't, I only saw that list. I don't know what the... Oh, there's, there's usually some talk about applying blockchain to every industry, <laughs> uh, but we'll see how things pan out. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And again, um, the doors are always open to questions, comments. They want comments. He individually responds to all 209 pages of them. So just comment and tell him hello. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm sure that would make your day nicer, even if it you know, might not be the most efficient use of time and resources. So thank you so much again, Dylan, mm -hmm. for sharing. And the purpose is, again, is that not just in these meetings, that every month. So if we have over 320 federal, state, and local programs working in emergency tech on this. There is no reach of public services where we don't have people at the table like Dylan that might not be in the panels, might not be in the press, but are the people building and making the decisions on how this is advancing. It's people like Dylan we need to make sure are at the table uh, and that you know and he's in within reach. He'll respond to anybody. Yes, sir. One well, quick. Yes. Um, um, one um, was a, if this is going to be a long question, we're going to need a mic on you. <laughs> and one that came up was to model blockchain with telehealth. So that's modeling uh, capacity resonance. And um, I analyzed it, I briefed it to. Uh, the process was uh, the uh, acquisition contract. Five, seven people for an hour meet talking. <laughs> had their own agenda at the end of the hour of the I rep. Um, it's, about, it's not going to save money. I apologize uh, for the people uh, online. We, we need to get you a mic because I can't repeat all of that. It's not going to save money within 120 days. So go. Find other avenues. Well, that was a barrier. Uh, it was a good thing, and it was with a great company uh, in a good, well thought out model. So, what do you do next? So, the question to those people who are out there is what do you do next? Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you really don't want to go into it all. No, I, I mean, what? I, I couldn't tell you. Honestly, um, uh, he doesn't have a mic either. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> to overcome Same barriers. people out there, we care about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, keep trying. I'm not. I'm not sure. I've never been on in the public or in, in the private sector before, so I don't. I don't know. At this, we're pretty open about doing new research, new things. They may not pan out. They they may pan out. I I, I honestly don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so the question was focused around acquisitions and we actually do have a little blurb coming up talking about some of the things that we're doing in one of our working groups around uh, acquisitions and procurement in addition to Kelly's work. So not specific to blockchain, but overall that will be semi addressed here in a little bit. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much again, Dylan. Uh, so the next uh, section that we had, so Again, we have a, a pretty robust and a lot of requests. And, and actually, people ask level of like, what's the most? In we get the most requests, the most resource hits on blockchain is the number one emerging tech that we get requests on and traffic. Second And second is artificial intelligence uh, and all of its things. And yet, one of the things is like, we, we've been spending a lot of time on the Hill lately, meeting with businesses and all answering the same questions. What's out there? Uh, and one of the people, and I, I don't believe he was able to join us, I'm, I don't see him, is we had actually invited the co-chair of the National Science Technology Council Subcommittee on Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence, uh, which is a group that, so I sit on for, for GSA, but there is people at almost uh, many government agencies that are charter members that get together uh, and work on, and this is the body that put out the report preparing for an AI future. Um, that organization still exists, but you sometimes don't read about it uh, online. And so we had invited him here to, to share a little bit on it, but regretfully, I believe something came up. So one of the things though, I'd like to say on, on a couple of things, just updates on our AI stuff. Uh, and actually we have NVIDIA in the room uh, too, which uh, we're actually looking forward to. We hear that there's a new training and education program uh, that they're working on. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but there's, there's a lot going on in this space. Would I, 
we're trying to open this up more and communicate that. Um, but again, it's not that a lot of this stuff is classified. It's just you're not. It's just not on a website yet. And that's one of the reasons that we're really trying to 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 open things up and have more events and communicate those needs. So it's like when Nvidia puts together a great training and education program, we can check it out. And like we've got Vern here from uh, National Defense University. Uh, who's focusing and really helping us pilot new training and awareness programs. So we're actually gonna go check out this week uh, their work. Uh, it's a robust space, but no one seems to know what is going on from the outside. And again, we hear that time and time again. Um, the issues that we're dealing with, and it goes back to terms of service, uh, in order to use some of these online tools that are out there, we need companies to adopt new terms. Of, so it's modified terms of service agreements. It's what Google had to do, Facebook had to do, Twitter had to do back when the digital services we were using with social media. Now there's all these voice activated services and, and, and everything that you are hearing about, but in order for the government to legally use it, they have to modify and make what's called federal friendly terms of service agreement, which given what's in the news right now, for the first time, we don't have to apologize for that process because it should become crystal clear to people right now why terms of service negotiation is such an important thing and user agreements and things like that. So. We have an effort right now working with our legal team uh, and working with companies in order to negotiate those next level terms of service agreements to make a lot of some of these AI tools that are off the shelf, make them legally available to agencies. We can't just rush and adopt it without considering because like even looking at some voice activated tools, this is gonna require new ways of looking at privacy, looking at security. It's things that even if there's a new terms of service agreement, it doesn't mean we should just be rushing to embrace it. It has to be done in a smart way. So one of the things that I would put as a, like a call to action is A, when identifying some of these tools out there, also consider what are all those necessary and legal things that obviously we need to do, um, like terms of service uh, to overcome it. Two, of course, we have a large effort going underway, launching this month around identifying and putting in the hands of federal workers training and awareness, um, training, education, and awareness. And it's not just the hard tech behind it. Uh, it's also training for non-technical senior leaders, for legal, for acquisitions, all the people in the federal and government space that if we don't do it and we don't ask for it, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, so those opportunities are at the table. Um, that being said, again, because regretfully the person who is going to come to share, I guess the third thing, of course, is find out who your leadership is and who's representing your government agency or the agency that you work for um, in artificial intelligence. They are at almost every agency. You just might not know them. You should find them, become their best friend, take them out to coffee. And especially if you have an interest or initiative, communicate to that to them because there is entire efforts, again, to map out what's going on, but it requires active participation. Now, that being said, that's, so that's our spiel on our end of it. Uh, is there any issues or opportunities that the group wants to raise around uh, AI for federal services? Sir. <laughs> So thank you. Um, I had a question. I remember last year you guys had uh, been instrumental in working on some of the uh, the internships at the State Department with with result with regard to blockchain. There was a, a pilot program. There's a lot of pilot. Programs. Right. So I'm just curious, like with AI, because I work with voice AI. Yeah. And I haven't heard anything yet. I don't know if you can comment on pilot opportunities. Well. One of the things that we had done actually at the very start of this program in trying to identify what the level of need and acceptance amongst agencies would be is that we held a pilot for uh, intelligent personal assistance where we worked with agencies in order to use their open data and to create things in Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, and all these things that you hear. Reason you don't see more of it is we are currently waiting to negotiate terms of service agreements. Again, we have already proven it is actually available in the Atlas. You can go, for instance, National Park Service, put together a digital ranger system. Is Todd Edgar here in the room, by the way? Todd Edgar is a hero wherever he is out there and it, the team, because again, the agencies 
did the proof of concepts, came to the table, mapped it out. The only reason that you don't see more of these services is we need the companies themselves to adopt federal federally terms of service, which again, I'm not going to apologize for today because look in the press and you'll see the importance of why we need better user agreements in terms of service. So the pilot was successful in that we knew this could be done and we knew that agencies were interested in it, but we can't do it without the handshake being met. And also we're working with people like the Privacy Council on looking at what are the implications, what are what are some of those standards that are needed, working, looking at security. So it takes a little bit longer, but what is it? Thoreau said I took the longer path, but it was worth it. If you if you are a, a literary scholar out there, you, that I just mangled that, but that's okay. I'm a technologist. Uh, so uh, but that's that's it. Is specific on that we get a lot of questions. Whatever happened to that pilot? We it succeeded on our end and agencies came to the table, but we can't go the rest of the way unless industry meets us on that. And we when we get great reception on it. It's just a little bit of a process sometimes. There's dozens of states that are part of this. Uh, no, and so our bread and butter for this program, like we put up federal, everything's federal, 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 because that's what we do. But somebody has a .gov address, we let them in to the programs because in order for any of these public services to advance, there has to be understanding at the federal, state, and local level. And we love our local and state partners. In fact, blockchain alone, um, Illinois, like we look to leadership sometimes uh, with the state level. It is a, it is truly a large community that works together. But I put federal on everything because that's our, our customer is federal agencies, but we open things up so anyone can benefit from what we find on it. And yes, we do talk to, when you see things happen at the state level, um, sometimes we've shared with them and sometimes we're just eagerly like looking like anyone else to see what's going on. Um, thank you. Thanks. Um, we did a pilot for the US Navy six months ago and it went really, really well. Speaking of pilots, how do you uh, recommend us looking for other pilots that other agencies are doing? Because, you know, these are, you know, we wrote a white paper around it, we published it. But these are some things that other agencies might actually benefit. Yeah. And so to not not spoil the, the run of show, uh, we're going to be discussing something later called the Emerging Tech Check, uh, which we have just launched. Um, we don't have anything out publicly on, because the whole thing is uh, because of the Paperwork Reduction Act, we can't share it widely because we can only have federal employees, again, our customers, uh, being able to respond. Uh, but we've launched what's it's the first ongoing discovery data call where any agency can report that they have a pilot program, they have a new resource, they have a paper, they have an event coming up, they want to have a pilot, they're interested, they have a concern about security or privacy. This will go out to thousands of government employees and every single month we will be producing a report based on that. So it's not just GSA or, or, or Jennifer knowing and having that bird's eye view, you all will have it the way it should be. Just, hey, Justin, do you have something on your website about what federal friendly terms of service means, guidelines, or best practices? Yeah, something tells me that's about to become the most popular website on GSA for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so if you go to gsa.gov and you search for terms of service, uh, not only is there a list of all the platforms, and some of them are older. I mean, we had to do this with MySpace. Uh, but the thing is, is that same process that we had during the age of, co of, of of spreading digital services and customer service and social technologies through government, that was a sustained effort that takes resources and legal minutia and everything at the table. We're about to have to undergo that for the for the AI field and for any of these other fields. And there's more complex issues out board. If anything that you see about right now, we cannot take this process for granted. So I invite all of you, go to that site, see what the process is. Uh, there's templates and everything up there. Uh, and you know what? Maybe that process needs to change. Maybe it needs to advance just like these things are. But we can't do that without you. So go check it out. Um, don't, don't shut down the website. Uh, but yeah, check out the terms of service. Legal terms of service. Yes. 
Oh, oh there's there, there's robust resources. There's both lists, there's examples. We make publicly available. Uh, so put it this way, if a digital service is being used by government, they publicly post their own federal terms of service, but they usually hide it a little bit because, you know, it's it's not like out there on their homepage, but it's all publicly available if you know uh, where to look at it. So we host it on GSA. We also have templates, guidance, resources. So if you have a tool and you're like, I'd love for the government to use this, one of the first things you should do is look at the terms of service process because that's one of the first starts. Uh, and that's actually what we tell us. A lot of these startups that are coming to the table and be like, you know how cool it would be if NASA used this or what do I want? I want State Department to use this. Start with those resources on gsa.gov. Thanks. So actually, more of a comment. There's an open source program out there called Mycroft AI. I don't know if anybody's worked with them. There's a open source program called Mycroft AI. Uh, the people behind it are generally trying to sell you smart speakers, but it runs on Raspberry Pi. It'll run on a, on a, um, on a Linux uh, PC. So if it's something you want to play with without uh, commercial terms of service, it's freely available. Just Google Mycroft AI. All right. So actually, we're we're veering, we're muddying up a little bit because we're we're jumping ahead, but that's fine because of the questions and everything. Um, listen. So this coming up month, and again, I apologize that uh, we had to change it up. Is we're going to be having forums on a monthly basis, only dedicated to AI. Uh, so you don't have to come here. It doesn't have to be a rush. And these programs and initiatives, again, this is going to be open to you. There is going to be opportunities to participate. Uh, we need more people at the table. And also remember that everything that I'm talking about is a sliver of what's going on government-wide. A lot of the times, that's why it's called the Emerging Citizen Technology Program, because a lot of what we focus on is the citizen-facing experience of it. But of course, now that's multiplied into workforce development, everything else. Uh, yes, we have a question over there. I'd, I'd suggest going to the microphone. That mic's not working. Oh, sorry, we have a question coming Thanks. from up there. Yes. Well, uh, it's more of a, um, you know, speaking of federal and uh, emerging technologies is, and engaging citizens, uh, we have a program. We're from the State Department. Um, my name is Asha Bay, and that's my colleague, Nora Dempsey, right there. We're from the Virtual Student Federal Service Team. And um, this is a, one great way to, you could work with government and do a a partnership with private firms and then bring in um, e interns to help with your project. So, if you're looking for help with your projects, our project submission period starts May 1st and it's open to all government employees. That's right around the corner. So, that's right. Oh, you've got, you've got I've handouts got some too. Handouts, yes. Awesome. So, I just wanted to let you know because I know we have someone from state here and. Um, Awesome. And we're going to send out your contact info and information on that in the notes and action items. Great. Uh, so thank that's going to go out to everyone and then it'll be on the website. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we'll keep rolling with this because there's a lot that we're going to talk about that directly involves AI, uh, but it's just not AI specific uh, on this particular one. So if we want to go uh, next um, to, and this is just a brief update. Uh, one of the things, robotic process automation, how many people are familiar with it? It works, cost savings, speeding up processes. We see. Yeah, well, it's automation. It's it's being able to automate. No, not necessarily, uh, but possibly. Uh, there's also the ability of, like, for instance, uh, Jeff Lau at GSA had a pilot program specifically uh, using robotic process automation. And again, it's like people worry about, it and they say they hear automation, and they think we're talking about replacing humans with machines. But what it really is, is taking the machine out of the person and empowering your teams and processes to, you know, not have to worry about so many clicks or so many, you know what I mean? Some of the things that, quite frankly, are the little things that add up, but if you can automate them, they can quickly, again, add up over the year to tangible cost savings and speed because agencies are being asked to do more with less. And so if there's something that, quite frankly, is minutia that can be sped up, we want that. And then because, again, that's in a way RPA is such a gateway to a lot of other emerging tech because there's not a single person who runs a government program that can't identify if we could just move a little faster on something, we could speed up and have cost savings. But the caveat we always say with that is that if you use RPA or any of this tech on a bad process, all you have is a faster, crappy process. 
that is why the entire thing we focus a lot on use cases and processes and problems because again this will be just a faster way to have bad processes but it is such an opportunity and it works and so one of the things that we talk about and it's tentative right now we don't have a date for it we're going to have a gsa robotic process automation day uh in summertime in order to focus really on on, on bringing it it'll be an inter-office initiative to focus on problems um, to be able to educate people on it and this is also something that we know other agencies are asking for and so while we're developing our RPA day. If other agencies or anyone is interested in replicating that, not recreating the wheel and take what we have and to be able to use it within your own agencies, that's really it. I mean, one of our big goals is shared services. I mean, in all sense of the word, because there's so much need. So the more that if we or, or if you're doing something that you can share with us, please let us know because there is a need in every government agency for these emerging tech programs. And if one of us does it well, we should be open that to everyone to use and that's actually the whole update so unless there's any quick questions on robotic process automation we can keep going all right we're, we so i think i'm a little behind so again um and so kyle richardson is out there uh i was not able to join us today uh so i'll give his update really quick um actually vr and ar was one of the first programs we launched in the emerging tech program there is significant need. There is the creation underway of looking at acquisition vehicles for it. Of course, we look at the DOD space and other ways in which this is being used for training, education, simulations, um, exciting things around exploring data in new ways. Uh, the business is here, the use cases are there. We're gonna be starting now monthly forums and meetings and opportunities in order for agencies to share what's going on and then automatically get brought in. Uh, so we're, again, regretfully, uh, Kyle, who has really stepped up. Uh, he's at FirstNet, uh, uh, focusing on emergency response, uh, and he's going to be taking point and helping coordinate those efforts. You're going to get his contact information. And again, the, the time is now for it. Is anyone here particularly passionate about VR or AR? Yeah, this, yeah Smart Cities guy is, is definitely in on it. All right. That's the whole thing. It's all to, all this stuff is integrated. And IoT, which isn't even on the agenda, is that we treat these things like separate animals and separate islands. These are not. This is co-integrated development. We just need to better align our technology services in such a way to meet that. So that being said, if there's not more comment on it, you're going to have all the opportunities that you want starting this month to deep dive into virtual and augmented reality. And there's a whole community there waiting for you. Next slide. Yes. So everything that we just went through, and we're actually going to the next section, are individual things that we are now going to start having regular monthly programming um, in all ways. And it's going to be based on defined needs and who comes to the table, but it requires you coming to the table. This stuff cannot be led just from within GSA or DHS or any of us individually. Every time you see something up here, there is a seat at the table for you and we need you to step up. And that's the only way. And actually that gets into this project right here is when we talked about what is it gonna take to create and sustain a both public and industry engagement around all these emerging technologies that are changing so fast, developing fast, how are we gonna do it? And somebody said flippantly, they're like, well, that's literally gonna take like a hundred people. But what choice do we have? This is necessary. I mean, you're here today for this, so obviously you believe it. So we call it the 100 Federal Leaders Initiative, where we're formally going to need people that are in offices, programs, different skill sets, different areas around government to formally step up and take on leadership and coordination roles to help make sure that these opportunities exist continuously this could be sometimes someone could give a lot, sometimes someone could give a little or not at all for a couple months. But if we all work together on this, we will have sustained continuous test evaluation, programming, education, awareness, really everything down the board. But it only happens when we all work together. And so uh, there's a challenge uh, like Jennifer, like Jennifer and her teammate Molly. We talked about the need for venture capital relationships better. 
they just said, well, let's co-chair a venture capital advisory group and invite people to that table, which you're going to get into. Was this a difficult process? No, it wasn't a difficult process. So let's roll back just a little All right, bit. Let's roll back. Um, so we have our Emerging Citizen Technology Council once a month, and it's open only to federal people. And if you want to get involved in that, either all of you out there, or if you're in the room and you're a federal employee, it's once a month, Justin sends it out. And then quarterly, we open it to the larger group like we have today. Out of that meeting came a number of specific initiatives, and we're going to go through each of the initiatives that we have thought of so far uh, in just a few minutes. And there are people who are sort of leading the initiatives. And my colleague Molly and I have taken on the venture advise, venture capital advisory group, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. But we have others that we're going to go through, and that's kind of where this is. So yeah. we're we're. We don't have time for the hour and a half that we've allotted to talk about all these things in any kind of depth. So that's the purpose of the individual groups to be able to figure out what our outcomes are, what we want to do in that particular space, and then come back to the larger group on a monthly basis to really kind of give a high level update. Yeah. And that's part of it is everything that you see here are things that were proposed at this meeting you just the previous one. And then we send it out to agencies and say, let's organize around this and do it. So a lot of what these meetings are going to be, again, is people can raise ideas, talk. There's a lot of sharing going on this one because this is the first public meeting that we've had. So we're going to have to share with you a bunch of this stuff and answer questions on it. But going forward, once you already know this exists, we're hoping you come to the table with ideas on initiatives and then we can put together partnerships to do it because we're doing this continuously. This isn't going away. This isn't a finite thing. This is the new norm for how we're going to be doing business. Um, and so we invite you to that. Uh, and hopefully, again, you can start in seeing that you can shape the future of our technology programs in the federal government because we absolutely need it. Um, and before actually we get into the emerging tech check, because uh, Vern uh, does have to go because she is a busy lady, uh, but uh, Vern at National Defense University, and we've been having, because who hasn't heard that education, training, and awareness and emerging technology for federal agencies is needed more? Did anybody not think that was an issue or a problem? <laughs> See, he's smiling. He knows it's, it's a problem. Uh, it's not a problem. It's an opportunity. And so, again, what we want to do is to be able to, to work with companies, see what is the absolute best that is out there, and then seeing how it could be applied because it's not just the hard tech we need. It's greater literacy in general and everyone to see how they're stakeholders. And we love coming to National Defense University in order to talk about advancements in tech programs. So Vern has stepped up to help us start piloting a new program and opportunities. Maybe you could introduce and talk. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Vern Wendt, as Justin said, and um, coming from the National Defense University. I've been teaching there for nine years now, and I've been teaching in the emerging technology space for seven of those nine years. Um, also social media, so pretty well versed in the, in the social, um, social digital technologies as well. Um, I will tell you, when I started teaching digital, um, it, all the emerging technologies, the big things we talked about were cloud computing, big data analytics, um, and a little bit on social media as well. Um, I will tell you what we're talking about now is blockchain. Everything that we're talking about now, artificial intelligence, blockchain. I will tell you the questions my students are asking her about are cloud computing, big data analytics, and how do I make sure that I can can get some better information about my organization? So you have to kind of look and see where we are in this space as well, as far as the federal government goes. So we do have the challenges of um, the acquisition. We do have the challenges of the terms of service. We also have the challenges of the security piece. You know, those are those are opportunities, as as Justin talks about. So what room I for room for growth, absolutely. So um, where what I see here is not. It is yes about the technologies, but yes also about all those other pieces that how can we move government forward to, to provide the best citizen engagement that we possibly can and actually to provide a better government product in general. So, um, so I just new to taking over this over um, and happy to take on anybody who wants to be part of this space, but there are kind of three different areas that I'm looking at as far as, um, 
you know, general purpose look areas. Um, the demystifying piece, it's the what is it? Let's general education, everybody. Let's let's figure out what works as far as understanding, yeah, AI is really not about killer robots. Well, it could be, but that's DOD, okay? Um, but um, <laughs> I got to well, laugh over there. Okay, uh, <laughs> Legal Autonomous Weapons Systems is the official name of the robots, and there's always a human in the loop. That is the United States' stance, and the United States' stance has not changed. So if you want to, you want to tweet me, it's Legal Automated Weapons Systems, and humans are in the loop. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> that's not what they're going to quote anyway. Um, so, and then the other piece is like, um, so number one, the demystification piece of it. Number two, the common ground piece of it. So happy that, that Justin talked about the fact that, that it is an overlap of these different um, technologies. It is an overlap of these different skill sets. It is an overlap of a team that you're going to need to work out. So where is the common ground that we need to educate and train people on? Um, how can we work that out? Um, so, and, and so perhaps the third thing that we could do is, is um, create power educators or power trainers. And, and that's going to be a combination of both federal and um, industry because um, industry is going to have the expertise on the actual technologies. Federal is going to have the expertise on the processes that we use to get things done. So, and this, that's what it's about. How do we get to yes? How do we get to yes? And part of it is the education piece of it. So in the notes, they'll have my contact information. If you want to volunteer, my call to um, volunteers, if you want to help me out here, if you want to, uh, if you're educated, if you're specifically interested in one specific area, I know um, Justin already talked a little bit about um, NVIDIA um, having some training available on the demystification side of things. Absolutely going to make sure that that's available to those who may be able to um, participate. We'll ask, we'll ask yeah. them. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Oh, wait, wait, no, we're still working. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Poor guy. They're, yeah, they're yeah. There. We love them, but like every time I, I, I look and I see the look on his face, he's like, wait, like, are we saying too much? Wait, are we, are uh, we adding too much? Okay, so we are in the process of working on, on different opportunities. I will tell you also for the government, free is a really good price. So, but not <laughs> yeah. The only price. But not the only yeah. price. So, thank you very much. Going to hand it back over to Justin. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Before you start talking more about death machines death and stuff. Machines. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you so much again on that, Burn. And again, it starts with, and you're going to see this as a, as a theme here. A lot of times in government, people have problems or they, they have an interest in things. They spend six months building something, then release it to maybe comment after the fact. And then, you know what I mean? And whether it works or not, we don't know. The whole approach that we have is essentially we're all talking, we're meeting, we're listening. Um, sometimes beer is involved and we identify the problems. So we make a commitment together to solve the problem. And that could change. That could be working on a pilot. That could be, um, you know, like we're agnostic on what the solution is as long as we're focusing on the problem and we want solutions to come from everybody on this. So specifically, I think the path we're going to take with this, um, everything is on the table to asking. So National Defense University has been such a wonderful partner for years, as you heard, in providing to a certain area training and education on technology. And we've been very glad to work with them. Now we have here, and then CC's in the back of the room, we have Digital Gov University at GSA provides constant in fact they're doing two events today training and education on things like ux digital government things like that there's a government and it's open to all agencies so if you saw on one side national defense university has a standardized training and then the ability to experiment on emerging tech we knew we could pilot there and then before we bring it to a government-wide platform through Digital Gov University. So that's kind of the path we're going to be taking in order to offer emerging technology training, education, and awareness programs freely to every government agency. If you have something at the table that could be part of that plan, please let us know. Uh, and also know the solutions are not coming from us within government. This has to be a partnership. Uh, with that. And so if you have something from the outside, please bring it in. There's never been a greater opportunity uh, to work together on this. And we, we are open to it uh, because it's the only way we're going to be able to keep up with this rate. So again, take that opportunity seriously, reach out uh, because this is happening now. This is launching this month uh, on it. Yes, sir.
agencies to take those courses? So, okay. Uh, and, and just to, to correct it. So people ask about this a lot because again, you see the slides and it says federal. Somebody was asking if this is also available to state and local. Just like this live stream is just on a website and anyone can see it, while we'll say it's for federal because that's our customers and you know we need to make sure we're servicing federal agencies, we also open it up so anyone can benefit. We want companies to be able to see these trainings so they then know how they can help and what our real problems are and provide those solutions. We want state and local at the table because A, we learn from them to begin with and B, I mean, they're just awesome people to begin with. You know, we need that connection. And so all these programs are designed for federal agencies. Again, that's our mission, but we are opening up as much as possible. And if something's going on in state and local government, we want, sometimes we will put them on Digital Gov University and broadcast that to every government agency uh, in that sense. So really think of this as a platform to be able to be used. I'm gonna talk about federal agencies, but really this is, this is all of us. This is a national priority. All right, any more questions uh, on the training and education aspect? It's there, it's open. You have a kind of, you know the problem, you know the path that we're gonna try to take. You've seen Vern, who's wonderful. Uh, and we'll go on to the next thing, that next slide. Oh yeah, emerging tech check, it's already there. Same thing, questions. Nobody knows what's already out there. Um, it is, because things are happening quickly, there's no real centralization. And there's not a lot of reporting structures that really move at the speed uh, and are targeted in the way that we need it. This is actually just the first page, so you can see. Uh, but we have now launched, uh, and just a week ago, the Emerging Tech Check. It was designed to solve a specific problem. A specific problem is that things that are publicly available information on artificial intelligence and blockchain and other emerging techs, nobody knows where they are because the government is a large bureaucracy and there is a maze of websites and resources and subcategories that keep you from information that you want to know. So what are we doing is we're starting a monthly ongoing discovery data call. Now people hear data call and they think compliance and they gotta do it. This is open and this is voluntary. So people can be able to ask, and, and we actually shared on our listservs the question specifically of, do you have a pilot program? Do you have a program period? Do you have resources? What are your needs? What are, you know, we ask the full gambit. And then so what happens is we're gonna be able to produce monthly reports that we're gonna share publicly so everyone can have a better understanding of where all the large and small pieces are across government in this. And again, so decision makers and policy makers and businesses and senior leaders can stop debating whether this actually exists or not in federal government and we can focus on what we really need to be doing, which is this responsibly managing and growing uh, the programs themselves. Um, so the Emerging Tech Check, you will, if you are not a federal employee, you will not see it uh, for the very purpose of the Paperwork Reduction Act limits us from taking an in input uh, in a structured format from people who are non-federal customers, but it's the federal agencies that you really wanna hear about on this. And we are starting a process, you're gonna see it, um, the results of it. And this is a process that can be replicated too. Um, and again, we've already have organizations that are asking saying, hey, having a voluntary discovery effort that is ordered to map out across government, all emerging tech, that's something we could use in ways that aren't even emerging tech. Yep. And you could beg, borrow, steal, and you don't have to beg or borrow or steal. We'll just give it to you um, um, for that process. So this is, that's what the emerging tech check is. If you hear about it, again, the problem we're solving is nobody knows the full breadth of what's going on and not because it's, some of it's classified, most of it's not. It's just that it's scattered, scattered across a bureaucracy that can be hard to navigate and scattered across digital services that can be hard to navigate. Um, and that's basically that. Is there any questions on it? And is anybody looking forward to seeing the results of this and being able to map out where all these programs and pilots and opportunities are? Christian back there, he likes it. Yep. All right, anything else? Any other questions? Yeah, this is kind of bookkeeping minutia right now, but it's actually, it's funny because we got, we're very excited about it because whether we're meeting with Congress, uh, whether we're meeting with companies, whether we're meeting internally within GSA or other agencies, nobody knows the full breadth of what's going on and it's an issue.
So this is something that we had to cobble together and go through approvals and stuff to build. And we thought, okay, this is going to be so exciting. It's going to blow up. And then it was like, people were like, oh, okay. I'll fill that out. And so it's hard. Sometimes we get really excited because we know that this will hopefully empower all of you for decision making. But then we realize that it's actually kind of a little mundane. It's a Qualtrics survey. All right. Any other questions on that to begin with? No. All right. Two. <laughs> We're tearing through. So these are all, again, these are resources you probably don't know about because this is the first time we've had a public meeting on it, but this is what the federal government is doing to build new infrastructure to address this. We got to cut down on emails. How many people have ever heard of Trello? Okay. Trello management dashboard. We use it internally in our program. Jennifer Hoover, DHS. It's kind of difficult sometimes to be able to coordinate, find out where projects are, right? Yeah, I email Justin and never hear back from him unless I text him privately. But I'm thinking of you all the time. <laughs> yeah, so this is, again, this is a very simple thing, and but also a, a function and management style that probably people don't realize that federal government is doing, uh, is A, we're taking our internal management Trello boards and we're going to make them available to all of our partners uh, that are working together um, on these specific programs. Um, like, for instance, obviously, we're tracking different collaborations we have with agencies. Um, actually, a little shout out to the Bold Line Public-Private Partnership Accelerator, recently released by State Department. That's where they're doing their public-private partnership on blockchain. Hopefully, at a future meeting, uh, they will be here to be able to share that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very simple function. So when you see this coming around, you're not going to have to ask permission to get updates on things. Again, you should be able to see this. You should be able to track these programs and manage them yourselves. And so that's what we're doing. It's all decentralization and empowering individual organizations to be able to manage these things while also it being reported in a way that we can then share with decision makers and policy makers and other. It's a simple thing. We're going to be sharing this, so so look forward to that. Uh, again, this is going to start. Um, I'm actually we're looking. I'm making sure that everything's on the up and up, compliance wise, because um, you know when I'm buried next week, I hope they carve on my tombstone that I was a compliant person, uh, if nothing else. Uh, and so uh, we're going to start with our interagency partners, uh, and then we're going to evaluate from there. And because there's all sorts of options to sharing publicly av available information on this. Uh, is there any questions on that? Is this something like if we had management dashboards to be able to track all projects in emerging tech across government, would this be something you would like? Joe Public back there, would you like that? Joe Public, you're here today, literally in the room. Uh, what he was saying is that it's, it sounds great, but that's going to be a lot of information, a lot of moving pieces and stuff. Yes. Yes, it is. And that's exactly what's going to be needed. That's why we have to reevaluate the pathways to acquisition resource. It's a complicated world that's moving quickly. We have to find new ways of doing business. So we're going to try this. If it doesn't work, we'll try what's next. But either way, we've got to attack the problem itself. Smart cities made an R RPA joke uh, no. to those of you who that. No, no, no. I no. I can actually write. You know how much of this we actually sit there and like. I need a robot to in order to expedite this process and stuff. And it just goes to show the great opportunities around that. All right, next slide. Yes. Uh, yes. So we're, we're, what we're going to do is meaningful share. Again, it's it's like it has to be identified by agencies because, yeah, contact info is publicly available information. Um, it's just the, the mechanisms in which we're able to share that um, is, is, you know, what I like. Yeah. 
I, I'd love to know the specific names of everyone to everywhere. We we have our own listservs that have um, and subscriptions that we're approaching now 3,000 people participating in the emerging tech programs. Uh, and we're always looking a way to, to decentralize that. But as you can imagine, we also don't want to create the situation where somebody gets a because maybe email is not the best way to contact somebody and that's like part of it is we have to cut down on emails and part of it then is opening up management dashboards and things like that um so it's not because I, I apologize if i haven't checked emails but there's been a while i've had to add a permanent away message up because we get so much emails we could hire somebody just to respond to emails uh, so there has to be a better way to manage these programs uh, than individual uh, contacts on that but that's, a, that's a, the issue that you raise is one that gets raised often. And if you've got ideas on how that could be done meaningfully, uh, please let us know. Because the other end of it is great, you have a bunch of names up, but what if that person then isn't available in a week? Or all of a sudden, they, so they get swapped out. It, like Things that seem simple when you're dealing with thousands of people can become a complex thing because we need to update and, and stuff like that. It's not that it can't be done, we just have to make a decision as a community that that's what we want. Uh, getting out of it, but thank you. We'll actually we'll note that in the the notes section that 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 need is there, and we'll, and we'll share that. Thank you. Uh, two, and we're actually and, and so we're going through this, and uh, regretfully, uh, and again, another person was not able to join us for this. Uh, but we even have a Christian here from Data Coalition, who's always been a fantastic partner to to work with uh, on this. Is the idea that because people come to us talking about AI. And they're like, well, Justin, we read about AI, our agency wants it. And we're like, so great. Talk to us about what's your cloud strategy? What's your data services strategy? And then people kind of look quizzical at it. And without realizing, because we treat these all like separate islands, um, cloud data services, you know, obviously emerging technologies that uh, is supposedly on an island that's only five years in the future, uh, which is weird. But so one of the things is we started meeting more and more with companies coming out from San Francisco because we have data.gov here at GSA, which is a repository for open data. And so more and more, we're spending our time with companies who are wanting to learn how that they can access open data for government uh, in order to fuel their programs. And that's aside from even us in government wanting to use that companies are relying on their innovations that they're building to use open data in government but there's a lot of questions on then what are standards or needs how do you make that best actionable and digestible because you can't just open it there you've got to be able to use it and that's a large conversation because like christian off the top of your head how many data sets are in data.gov alone is that a figure roughly over 10,000, over 10,000. So that's a huge coordination effort. But again, this comes down to when we talk about data is like the main resource, it's the oil, it's, the, it, it, it's fueling so much of this innovation. And if we're just looking at AI on one side of the house, and, but we don't have at the table at all times, open data and data services, we're not putting the pieces of the, the puzzle together. Now this idea and this concept of alignment is one that was exceptionally well and positively received by both communities. And so one of the things that we're doing and whether it's working with people like the Data Coalition or uh, working with our own agencies and, and working with you is having an ongoing dialogue uh, and projects on how is the federal government using and opening data in a way that is both beneficial to our own management and also allows it to be the fuel of innovation for the private sector. Uh, and that's something that, again, it's initiative that we've launched. Um, any of you who are interested can have a seat at the table at it, uh, because this is something that, again, it comes down to something that's not just government, it's American innovation itself. Yeah, Christian, would you like to maybe say something? Okay, so Christian is has gone from ten thousand to just over two hundred thousand. Hopefully, not while we've been sitting here. That would be weird. But obviously, you can see the challenges then in even raising standards and, and getting that across the board literacy. But if we don't do it, it's not going to be done. Which is why we've got to work together in partnerships to do it. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, how do, why, you're you're rather, rather talkative, gentlemen. Why don't you sit over here? Um. Leverage 
White House is um, federal IT modernization and funds. Um, do you have any suggestions on uh, decision making on that or aligning uh, companies for those modernization kinds of funds? So you're talking specifically, and, and to just to repeat the question, about what's maybe the role of this with IT modernization. That's actually a regular talking point of ours is too much we talk about things like AI as three to five years in the future. And right now, it can be and should be core to IT modernization itself today. And that's part of it. And that's why, for instance, the Open Data for AI initiative that we're having is so important because in order today to be able to fuel some of these innovations, we need to get our nuts and bolts better aligned. And that's what's really going to open up the door to that. Uh, and so again, if you're, you're if you're putting together a process on it, please join this conversation and seat at the table because anybody who's tired of hearing about this stuff being in a far off future and wants to have solutions that impact people today, please, please join us uh, in this effort because that's the main Russian push. Thank you, and Dan's over there. Thanks, Justin. Um, so uh, reading questions from the public. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully folks can hear me. Uh, I know we've got a few other things to discuss, but I did want to ask one from the online folks around AI, which is um, whether there are any federal groups working on ethical algorithms or ethics more generally with AI. I love this question because we get it all the time. Uh, and so there are people within government every week, probably every day, discussing these very things, ethics and AI. And like one of the things that come up and, and this is not, I have no opinion formally on this one way or another that believe that if the government is using an algorithm, it should be open sourced and then accountable and then people can review it. There is all sorts of questions on the privacy and the ethics that are going on. And if you are passionate about that and you're concerned about it, but you're not at the table and you don't know where those things are happening, let us help you with that. Because again, and this is like, the purpose of you guys sitting here today and us opening up these meetings is the fact of that these are very important projects and conversations, but if they only happened in the walled garden of government, we're going to lose that. And we're not going to have the outcomes that are so desperately needed right now. And so it, whether it's ethics or privacy or security, if that is what you want and that's what you want to contribute to and you want to be accountable for and you're not part of that conversation, I promise you that conversation is going on right now. And there's an empty seat at the table that should have been yours. Um, and so that's part of when you join these programs and you work with us, we're, we're constantly going to try to point you to where these things are because you should already know it's public information. It's confusing. It's confusing navigating a lot of this stuff, but that's why we've got to do better. All right. So I think we kind of explained that a little bit. Now, are we coming to you in a second? Oh, yeah. Next one. Oh, great. Jennifer Hoover. <laughs> Jennifer Hoover, Deputy Director, Office of Venture and Innovation at Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Molly Kane is tech scouting out in Houston and couldn't make it here today, but she is on the line and uh, gave me lots of notes. Uh, let's see. So I'll only take a couple of minutes. Uh, we're really excited to announce the first venture capital advisory group. We're going to be launching in May with our inaugural members of the venture board. We're not quite ready to announce who they are yet, but we have some really fantastic people lined up in the venture community, and we're very excited to be able to share that. Uh, our first. What do, can you explain? Does everyone know what even like venture capital is at this point? This guy's nodding and smiling. Why don't you just explain real quick, like what what VC world is? Okay, so the venture capital community is uh, groups of companies that help startups and um, get funded and grow. And um, the government really doesn't have a lot of interaction with those startups at this time. And there are ways for them to kind of get into the government, but the venture capital companies help mentor them and grow them and get them uh, comfortable with being part of this type of community. So we're working with the venture capital companies and there are a number of them out there. 
uh, Trident and NEA and um, I think Ashton Kutcher has one that's really popular. I can't think of what it's called. Uh, do you know? No, I don't. No. I can't think of the name of it right off the top of my head. Uh, but there. Sorry, Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> since obviously you're watching right now. Probably, because um, these are the important things in life. Uh, but they they help uh, drive startups forward and and get them ready to to launch fully and hopefully become fully funded functional companies. Yeah, and a lot of it, and like when we were talking with Jennifer, is and again when we come back, what was the problem? The problem is is that, and you all know this. We like focusing a lot on what's directly in front of us because especially when we're asked to do more with less, it's really hard to then let go a little bit and keep your eye on the prize in the future because we're trying so hard to properly manage and resource what we already have. But we can't do that. We can't just have this dumb narrative that government is always 10 years behind on a lot of technologies that, hey, we're the ones who invented uh, at some times or, you know, DARPA and other things, because again, we have such great responsibility to focus on what we have. We knew now looking at organizations like InQtel, looking at Homeland Security, working with National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, these offices that have direct relationships with the VC community to be able to know better of what's coming next. And what are those things at the absolute bleeding edge of emerging tech? Isn't that something that everybody would like to be part of or have a greater understanding and relationships? We knew, we heard other agencies say, I want to be like Jennifer Hoover. We all want to be more like Molly Kane and Jennifer Hoover, obviously. But we thought, let's create that government-wide program then. Let's make it an interagency venture capital advisory group so any of these agencies can then work with people like Homeland Security, uh, and have these relationships. And again, it takes what was pockets of genius around government and mainstreams it more. Uh, and so thank you. And you said May, like how can people get involved with this? Right. So we have the first Fed only venture capital advisory group. And I believe Molly sent out uh, sent out invitations for that the last week of May. We've already got it. It's Fed only. We have partners in SBA, USAID, uh, FBI, state, DISA, DOE, and DOD that are going to be part of it. If you are interested, if you're a federal employee and you are interested, please send an email to innovatedhs at hq.dhs.gov and hashtag venture in the subject line. And uh, all that information will be going out. If you're interested in joining that initial uh, advisory board, we will be meeting at the end of April, and then we're going to open it up to the greater board to include the venture capital companies in May. Uh, so that invitation should have gone out, and if it hasn't, it will be by the end of today. And we will be posting more information on what we're doing, the scope of the planning, the ideas that we have on the Venture Capital Advisory Group on emerging.digital.gov. You can just click on the link. We'll be providing that information. Uh, we actually have a few of our venture capital guys on the line. So, hey guys, we're very excited to have you join our board and help us drive the government and emerging technology forward uh, here in the coming months. So we're very excited about that. Yes, and thank you so much uh, to your team, by the way, because again, we identify a problem, we identify a new capability that we know the US government is gonna need. We ask people to step up and launch it. And just in such a quick amount of time, you were able to do that. Uh, just like Anne with, with our academic outreach, which will be coming up soon, is that people are stepping up to address these needs. And this is the type of thing, people don't think government is doing things like even reaching out to venture capital world and it's in, it's crazy. Right. We're uh, and definitely so, reaching out. Yeah, we're definitely reaching out. And again, uh, and the homepage for this, again, for all these initiatives is emerging.digital.gov. You will see the updates. You will see the reports. You'll see the opportunities to participate there uh, if you want to check it out. But if anybody tells you that the federal government is not working with startups, venture capitalists, and the bleeding edge of, edge of technology, tell them to go get you a coffee, lock the door when they leave, and then come and find us and join and get your seat at the table for it. Right. And we are actively having conversations on LinkedIn and Twitter. You can look up hashtag FedVenture, F-E-D, 
B-E-N-T-U-R-E, uh, to see what the conversation is all about. And as we drive this group forward, we will be continuing our social media campaign around hashtag FedVenture. You can always look that up. And Molly and I are actively updating the Venture Capital Advisory Group um, as often as we possibly can with new information. Yeah, so thank you so much. And thank you again for that. Uh, is there actually quick questions? Are there any, any questions? Does it sound cool? Like this is, does this sound like the type of work you would hope uh, is going? She's nodding and smiling over there. Excellent. Yes, sir. At the high level, high level, I'd like to know what the group is chartered with. Is it for the, is it for the U.S. government to function as a fund of funds? Is it for, you know, this to be a federal advisory committee act type of you know, vehicle or, you know, kind of the, the outcome statement, if you will? Um, so and I, I, I'll soften that <laughs> before we get to you, uh, is again, uh, and this is the thing, is that everyone, every time the government does something, it's what's the governance document, what's the, we start with the problem, we start with the need that we have, then we invite people to the table in order to build charters and do stuff like that. Uh, but all of that is secondary uh, to tackling the problem itself. Uh, and so, and I know there's gonna be questions about all the scope and everything like that. That's why we're letting you, you uh, that's why we're letting everyone know about it because we're gonna build that together. This isn't just something you're getting brought into in the last minute. These are conversations that we need to have. And this should not be behind the walls of government, just these conversations, especially when it comes to public-private partnerships. Uh, and so as far as like, and, and I'll let you take it, but um, everything is at the table and everything can be changed based on what the need is and what the capabilities are at the time to do so in a compliant way. And the initial Fed meeting, Molly and I, or DHS, we are not making uh, streamlined decisions and saying this is what venture capital is. It's why we've gathered a group of other Feds so that way we can have a holistic view of what information we need to, what we need to gather. And so we're going to understand the true scope and breadth of our venture venture capital advisory group whenever we have our first Fed only meeting to understand what our outcomes will be uh, in the coming months. So we will have that. If you're interested in joining or there's something specific that you think should come out of it, I believe you can comment on the venture capital advisory group page on emerging.digital.gov. So you can definitely submit your feedback ideas and you can also email directly innovate DHS at hq.dhs.gov with hashtag venture in the subject line. We specifically look at those among the extensive amount of email we get, but we look specifically for that. So you can contribute your feedback and insight into what you think this group should be because we have a lot of ideas internally, but we are also working with some really amazing other people and other agencies to uh, make sure this is a nice rounded out uh, activity. Yeah. And also, and just to clarify in case anyone went to, so FACA, Federal Advisory Council, there's a lot of words in government that trigger a lot of processes and needs and things like that, uh, which is why we use the term group uh, A, because words do have meaning uh, behind this. So we, we, we don't easily say that we're putting together a council because that brings a lot of responsibility and a lot of things. Um, this is convening it. Um, but also the minutia of, because we're also moving pretty fast for government. Uh, and so first we identify the problem, we get people at the table, then we put together the action items on how we can go, because there's a myriad of different paths we can take that are viewed and regulated in different ways. Um, and those are decisions we can make together uh, on it, really. So thank you. And thank you again so much. Uh, and if there's any more, is there any more questions on that? I don't think so. This guy looks happy, maybe. Does this sound like something you'd like to participate in? See, he's nodding. All right, thank you so much. Next slide. See, this is so big, it can't even fit on one slide. <laughs> All right, let me throw this in here. So my name is Ann Mesita. I'm a State Department officer, but I'm on assignment as a visiting scholar at GW. Um, and that's what puts me into the academic realm. And to Justin's point of both inclusion and in development, we've uh, had some civil society groups are reaching out as well and wanna make sure that everyone is involved in the conversation and the communications. So on the uh, Atlas, so emerging.digital.gov, you see academic 
uh, research that will be expanded to include uh, civil civil society folks by popular well. demand by popular demand. Um, so we really want to make sure that um, not just industry, not just government, but everyone who can be involved in uh, emerging technologies in this discussion is part of that conversation. And uh, we've had some call outs just in our federal meetings to start to ask the questions of what would agencies want to know or what kind of collaborations exist um, with this world. Um, so what we'd like to do is to start some of those two-way uh, discussions, as Justin mentioned, make sure that there is a back and forth, both in the conversations and creating communities that have uh, common interests, but then also identifying resources that those groups can use. So um, one of the first questions that came out of our, our very informal discussions was that there are agencies within the government that are interested in blockchain and other emerging technologies related to human, human rights and labor rights. So this is a shout out to all of you who are involved in that, in the academic, civil society, and also in uh, industry. If you are interested or you have activities in that area, we want to be able to share that with a wider group. Um, so if you go to the uh, atlas and you click, there's the, the, the general email um, and you can hashtag it for academic. So if you are a PhD student or you have um, an ongoing project that's in this area of blockchain with human resources, and uh, labor rights, we'd like to know. And also through the tech check, we'd like to know other agencies, if you have interest and you wanna know what's going on out there, there is so much going on out there, not just within the government, but also within these uh, groups. So we'll try and, and uh, address different questions and get those communities together and talking with each other. Yeah, and, and thank you so much. Uh, like, and to go back to even like the problem is in one week we had Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and Carnegie Mellon, in one week, people from all of those reach out to ask to research blockchain in the federal government. And but they're emailing us. The, the whole thing is that there's, oh, and this is an ongoing theme. There's more going on than a lot of people realize. But so many times that relationship becomes either anecdotally of what you read online or who you might know. Right now, the U.S. government must support and partner with leading academic research facilities, both to make sure that, the, that, that they get what they need and we get what we need. And that is a, one of the easiest and beneficial relationships that there are in pursuing emerging tech in the United States. And yet it's been so ad hoc. And then not that, and I'm not going to say it because there has been organizations like National Science Foundation um, that, and organizations within government have taken such a strong leadership role in this. But we want to make sure that even then that everybody has access to the full breadth of all government programs. And so it's not just who you know or what you're able to read, but if we have a need, we can articulate it and we can work with our partners and other agencies. And also they can, like academics, can re reach out to us or civil society members uh, and organizations to demystify that entire process. And we said the problem, she, she took it on and that now it's here. So thank you so much for your leadership on that. How can people get uh, involved? Well, in, in addition to that, so the, on the, the conversations aside really quickly, because I know we're headed into lunch, I'm also looking at resources that are available. And Erin from NARA is here. Okay, um, so we had a great conversation with NAR, and uh, we talked about the open data for AI, obviously researchers that are out there that can use that data, but the National uh, Archives also has a huge repository of public domain um, materials that they have a commitment to providing greater metadata and things like handwriting recognition, et cetera. So if there are academics out there looking for databases and materials that they can start to test things on, that they're doing research projects on. This is a great um, resource, which in the federal government, it's publicly available. And I can tell you, if you're doing handwriting research, I looked at one from Kennedy, uh, where he had done some doodles during the Cuban Missile Crisis. If your AI can can read Kennedy's uh, handwriting in that one, that that's pretty impressive. Alec, so is it? It does it exist out there? Okay, see, so we, they've got really, um, these are real world, your ability and your technologies can help the National Archives make these available for the American public and can also test your, um, your different algorithms, your AI programs. So what I'd like to do is to make sure that everyone in the academic and also the, the industry knows those types of things are available and then also make a call out to the agencies that are here to really think through what you might have something that you might be able to do a collaboration with, like this repository, 
that we could make sure that everyone knows about and put those out? Do you have video recordings? Do you have audio recordings? Do you have other types of uh, documentation that could be public domain that we could use in sort of, I guess it's not a sandbox, maybe it's a testing playground. Um, we need, to make we it need a better term yeah. than sandbox. Do so, kids even know what sandboxes are anymore? I don't know. So maybe it's video. Yeah, it's on their iPad. Yeah. So, um, so trying to make this both ways. So for the government to help provide resources as well and conversations going back and forth. So it is dynamic. Please um, send in your comments again, as all of us have said, um, and we will develop it as, as needed. Um, by the group. Yep. And so we have a portal for that. And again, all of this stuff, emerging.digital.gov. Uh, it just went up through a facelift recently. Uh, and we can continue because it's GitHub pages. We can go in and just start editing things based on need. You can recommend things. Uh, and so please uh, use that for the portal for any of this stuff. And, and thank you so much, Anne, again, uh, for, for everything. Uh, next slide. All right. And Vern already talked about training and education. Again, and you could see whether it's this individually, that, this, is that these all came from problem statements that we all know that we have in our conversations with agencies, with businesses, with congressional staff, with policymakers, decision makers, civil society groups. These are all problems that we know and understand. So we're just going to start doing stuff about it. But in order to sustain that, we need your participation and we need your leadership on it. The doors are open uh, and, and we really need that. What's the next slide, by the way? All right, because this is actually a functional meeting. New business, uh, because eventually everything that we just shared at one time was new business that was raised at one of our interagency meetings and then a coalition built around it and we went. So there's a whole world out there and, and things that we should be focusing on. Uh, is there anything that we didn't talk about or that's a hot button issue that you think now, now knowing this approach, knowing this, what's at the table and knowing what we can achieve, which is ultimately anything. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen it's a wonderful life. People always ask, well, how much budget you have? And it's like, we've got nothing. And yet we're the richest people in town, like George Bailey, because we've got friends. Uh, and because when we work together on this, there's nothing we can't achieve because we're doing it together. Um, and so what should we be doing? Is so new business? Is there is there something? And what? if anybody's online who has a comment, a question, please put it out there in the comments. We have somebody actively checking and we can address that here. So please, any comments, questions, yeah, ideas, thoughts? Anything. What about you, Matt Leonard? <laughs> he's, he's got nothing right now. What about you, ma'am? So I was at a conference last week where there was a, use, uh, a case study uh, by State Department using a software and using it abroad. And the question was asked around um, uh, compliance with data privacy laws in Europe. And the person there um, didn't know what that was. So um, it led me to believe a member of the public that the State Department had implemented something that wasn't in compliance with law. So in all of these um, exercises, do you have people um, with a background in law and policy on all the teams? So this is something, so policy, law, are there's a lot within this community because the fact is we target for, for outreach to bring that to the table. I, I think one way, and again, just because people don't know about it, or I, I mean, frankly, if somebody misspoke on a panel, that happens all the time. And that's why we can't rely on panels to be the official mechanism of sharing what's going on in the federal government is because a lot of people working on emerging tech are not talkers even they're, you know what I, and that's that's because they're fantastic at what they do best they might not be spokespeople they're the ones actually getting it done but we have so much emphasis on making everyone a spokesman and then only learning about these programs through anecdotes that's why we're trying to open up the seams and open up the dna itself um and so what i would say is that's probably something you're going to see in the coming months um is program specific focus on things like policy um and you know privacy and other areas that are happening and conversations are happening and work is happening but you might not hear about it and because and again i'm sorry if you ask a question of somebody on a panel, it's become can feel like a government employee, like it's a game of gotcha. Mm -hmm. And that's not 
how to no 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 i know that you did it I'm, I'm just saying in general like this is this is why we got to open up the, the problems and open up the programs because if we're just learning through panels you're basically reliant on someone being an extroverted talker which i'm promising you emerging technologies it ain't us uh in that sense so it's already going to be a, a hard equation um but yeah so look for that and so is there's like so policy and what was the other one? I just wondered policy and support to incorporate the requirements in the architecture, yeah. whatever you do. Well, one yes, of the legal things- Yes, legal and policy are at the table. They oh. are. And one of the things in the um, training and education piece that we kind of covered earlier is that we understand that there's a communication disconnect between IT and policy, IT and legal, IT and procurement. Uh, so one of the things that the focus is on, and we've been talking about it now for about three months, uh, and it'll be kicking off, I'm not kicking it off, but uh, is the training and education. So that way we can get everybody speaking the same language. It is in plain language. Just like PASA acquisition, we're trying to put it in plain language so that we are all speaking the same language, that we can drive this stuff forward. Yeah. No, no, and it's it's a great it's a great thing that you shared because again, this is exactly the kind of problem that we're all working together to try to overcome. Any other things? This is new business area. You can you can share anything. Yes, sir. Oh wait, no, no, let's let's take something from the online people. All right, so this will be a little bit of a choose your adventure for the two of you based on where you want to start. <laughs> Uh, I've got some more specific to NIST stuff that Dylan may be able to answer, and I've got others that are maybe a bit more in the weeds. Uh, so, let's start at the top then. How about this? Because we've got uh, we've got nine minutes, and we want to get through as many questions as we can. Mm -hmm. And the ones that we don't answer, we can follow up on because again, it's not like you're going to leave here. We put the tables back, close the doors, and hopefully Matt Leonard writes a nice article saying how the government invited people in for a day. This is ongoing. This is sustained. This is real. Look, there's empty seats in here. 500 people signed up for this event. And then some people did not show up to claim their seat. It's ridiculous. I mean, there is so much need around this. We've got to take it seriously. And please know that when government opens the door, it's because that guy responds to every one of those comments that have come into the NIST thing. People don't believe that. They think when you leave a comment online, it goes into this black box that disappears into nowhere. I'm telling you right now, it's real okay. and it's necessary. Oh, yeah, I'm so ahead. sorry. You see, <laughs> I am the talker. That's why they have me up here. I it's apologize. Good, Justin. You don't have to apologize for the passion, you know? Uh, so we'll start with the NIST stuff. Um, and Dylan, maybe we'll Yeah, Dylan, do you, you want to come up here for a little bit? like no <laughs> see dylan would probably be an example of the brilliant person who's making it happen in government that probably would doesn't want to do the <laughs> i'm not <laughs> talking yeah. so dylan we've got a few questions as huh? justin mentioned i'll just do one for you uh which is where can i find out more about the nist study group for use cases uh it's an iso study group not a nist study group mm -hmm. for use cases um you can do that uh if you're a U.S. person, you would have to go through insights, ANSI insights to join the group because uh, ISO produces copyrighted standards that they sell. So unfortunately, you would have to be a, a member to either work on it as it's being developed or purchase it once they start selling it. But I, I think I'd have to check. Maybe technical reports are offered for free. I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't care about the logistics of purchasing them personally. <laughs> okay. I'm just developing them. So. Okay. Thank you. All right, next question. And then uh, Jen and Justin, one for you. Uh, has OMB started any working groups around blockchain's effect on A123 internal controls? See, here's where we get to the thing where it's not that it doesn't happen. It's just that it sounds to like off the top of my head, it sounds like you just said a Star Wars character. Uh, and so, uh, which obviously we'll, we'll get done this and I'm like, oh, shocks. Um, one thing that I, that I can say is that OMB, multiple offices have been shown fantastic leadership and insights um, in addressing this uh, and talking at all levels, believe me just because you might not hear it on a panel or in an article does not mean it's not happening. There's a great concern about stifling innovation. 
and this is not specific to OMB, it's not specific to us or anything, but a lot of times, especially in our government services, the people that you look to that think will be adding all this structure to it are being hands off for a reason, not because they're not thinking about it, but because they are thinking about it. And this is such an early stages in so much of this that there is like people don't want to stifle innovation. So you could, there's probably a million questions about is this one particular office focusing on X, Y, and Z? I, I go off the top of my head, I can't, and it's not for me to say. But what I can say is that there is no one who isn't in one way thinking about this and its implications uh, across the board. Um, and it's just something where it might just not be publicly talked about as much. And again, that's why we're 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 trying to do this to let people know it is here, and we are talking on it. Thank All right, you. next question. Oh wait, sorry. Yeah, yes, sir. Can you go to the mic, or or is it a short one? And we can just. All right. Yes. I have an idea right now. Yes. Of a pilot program that I've already worked in the private sector with some companies for great things. I want to do that with the government. Like, what do I do? Like, what, what's my next step? So I've got a proposal here. Do I attend the monthly meeting? Yeah. Like, how do I get that started? I would say the first step is to go and sign up and join the, the public facing listservs again uh, and use it. And, and because again, there is, there's over about 3000 people subscribe to these various ones that are connecting with, and a lot of them are federal people and people don't use that opportunity enough. And I mean, cause it, the big thing is when we, when government opens its door, what are the big fears? A, that people will troll the hell out of us and then make it so we have to shut the doors Two, that companies will sit at the table and then just advertise their products and services. So essentially it is, we're opening up the door. There's these list serves, share the idea, talk about cold, like be like, listen, this is something that we're really interested in. And we want to talk to other people who are interested in this, or maybe we're interested in putting on an event or something to be able to explore this. That's a great way to do it. Um, and it's, and again, it's that kind of, if you in a business is all these opportunities exist for, and that starts with you joining that list serve. Cause again, all opportunities will come through there. And then just be cool about it too. Uh, and again, that I think that's why a lot of people are quiet on the list serves is they're afraid of not walking the line, or you know, you don't want to share too much or, and stuff. So, so just do it well. And again, just what you said, I'm in, I'm really interested in this. I want to know who else is interested in that. Um, or you could say, I would love to know resources on how I can get started. There's an entire community of hundreds of people there that will see that and plug you into stuff. So, and, it, and that's the thing is it's it's sitting right there and people sometimes they just don't know because they don't believe that the government would even have such a thing um, and it was built for you so please check it out and when you do introduce yourself and say you were at this meeting and uh, we would love that again we need more two-way dialogue um, and that's w what you could definitely help with we have time for one more question Dan do you have one more question for us it has to be a good one <laughs> yeah make it make it the good one <laughs> All right, I'll see what I can do. Uh, They're all so good. We've got a question about um, how quantum computing interfaces with some of what we've discussed today, uh, particularly blockchain. So, uh, <sighs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> so actually, and this is gonna surprise people, is that we've already received many calls and requests from agencies to start a government-wide quantum computing program. Uh, and so that's, so we, we talk, we, we talk about RPA, we talk about AI, we talk about blockchain. This all intersects with IOT. This all intersects. And then of course, the like quantum and other things are going to be part of this. We're limited by who we have standing up to partner and take leadership on it. The only reason we don't have a quantum can, uh oh, Dylan, Dylan, can you do this? No. Are, are you raising your hand or are you going like this, calling me a loser? No, I didn't say. So there's there's NIST resources. So we're going to start actually. Uh, so again, we release all action items and notes from this. We're going to include that resource in it, uh, so you can know. And two, maybe this is a big call to action 
where we can do whatever we need to do based on needs from agencies. If you have a passion for quantum computing and you've seen some of the leadership from NIST and from NASA in particular uh, in this space, and we want to add quantum computing to the emerging technologies fold, only thing that's stopping us is empty seats up here. So that's something that we could use uh, people to step up on and leadership on. We could take one more. Let's take one more question <laughs> to err on the side of, of being uh, very open. Is anybody here uh, in, the, in the back row? You, you had a question earlier. See, we, we also, uh, and she's walking to the mic too. You're yeah, super I'm citizen. Really boys, but I just felt like I was having a cathartic experience because I am from OMB on that question about A123 and, um, and, and Thank whether, you for coming, yeah. by the way, here today. You see, everyone always wants to know, is OMB even thinking of this stuff? And, and we They're are. here. And it's exactly like you said, mm -hmm. that um, we are thinking about it in many ways. OMB can be an, a, a force and accelerate things. And in some ways, we can also kind of get in the way. And we're trying to figure out where that balance is right now. And I want to say that there are some things that we want to do to put some structure around what agencies are doing. So I really like what you're doing and, and we hope to partner with you so we can take advantage of uh, or leverage some of the tools that you've been using and some of the good thinking that's going on at OMB. Awesome. Thank you. And again, this is a perfect example. People ask all the time, is OMB thinking about this stuff? OMB is right over there yeah. <laughs> uh, and obviously thinking and investing time into this. And so th thank you so mm -hmm. much. And on the, a couple of questions um, from businesses who want to partner with agencies, um, there are many people in, in acquisition, because I'm in the Office of Federal Procurement um, Policy, and people in the acquisition community call me and ask me, where do I find um, vendors? How do I get started in this? And um, I just wanted to start the, the, um, the conversation on your, uh, on your listserv and You'll, I think you'll be surprised at how, you know, the second and third order effects of how people get information and get connected. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. And thank you so much for coming and, and, and tying that up. That being said, it's lunchtime. Uh, again, this is this wasn't a production or a big show. This is a normal meeting that we have every month. We're going to open it up to people as much as we can. If there's more demand, we can open it up more. If there's empty seats at the table, we're not going to open it up as much because, again, it's we limited resources. So it's really driven by your demand. It's demand from agencies. It's demand from businesses and knowing that we have to tackle these problems. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and everyone have a great day.